welcome everyone once again to our course solar photovoltaics. Today we will learn about how to make a single crystal silicon from a metallurgical grade silicon and how to assemble them to fabricate a silicon solar cell. Now if you remember in the last class we have learnt about starting from the sand how to process metallurgical grade silicon and we have mentioned that metallurgical grade silicon has a purity of 98 percent. This is good for steel and aluminum industry, but if you wanted to go for electronics industry, we need to further purify it. Today we will learn about starting from metallurgical grade silicon, how we can make a semiconductor grade silicon. For use in solar cell as well as in other semiconductor devices, silicon must be very pure in comparison to metallurgical grade silicon. What we mean by the very pure is the purity of silicon which is 99. 0.99999 percent. So, there are 6 9 after the decimal point. The standard process is purifying is known as the Siemens method or Siemens process. Siemens process is usually adopted in the industry to make a polycrystalline silicon starting from the metallurgical grade silicon. What is a Siemens process? The metallurgical grade silicon is converted to a volatile compound that is condensed and refined by fractional distillations. What is a fractional distillation that we will learn? Ultra pure silicon is then extracted from this refined product and fine metallurgical grade silicon particle is fluidized with HCl or hydrochloric acid in the presence of the copper catalysis. The gases emitted are passed through a condenser and the resulting liquid subjected to multiple fractional distillations. So, in fractional distillations we vary the pressure and we get it the required chemical or required materials out of a combination of the material. Now we use fractional distillations in Siemens method to produce this trichlorosilane or ACGSIHCl3 and the source material for the silicon industry. This trichlorosilane is further used to extract the ACGSI or the ACGSI is extracted, the ACGSI HCl3 is reduced by hydrogen when the mixture of the gas and heated. Silicon is deposited in a fine grain polycrystalline from onto an electrically heated silicon rod. So, the reaction process can be summarized by the following method. So, we start with a metallurgical grade silicon which is MGSI, we react with a 3 HCl hydrochloric acid. So, what will happen? We will make chlorosilane. SiHCl3 which is a gas plus hydrogen. Silicon will react with this HCl to make SiHCl3 and hydrogen. Now this SiHCl3 this has been condensed and it went through further multiple fractional distillations. So fractional distillations has been done of this silicon. What we get from there? We get SEG SiHCl3 and from there SEG SiHCl3 which is a gaseous form we react that with a hydrogen to get the hydrogen will react with this chlorine to make the 3 HCl again and it will release the ACG SI from this chlorosilane compound. So, we get the polycrystalline silicon and also get the hydrochloric acid back. This hydrochloric acid can further use to reduce the metallurgical grade silicon to make the chlorosilane. So, this process then repeats and we get polycrystalline semiconductor grade silicon. In this furnace here, what we do here, you see that this furnace has a reaction chamber and there is a silicon breeze and this side there is a silicon slim rod is there. Now, the chlorosilane which is coming from here as a gaseous form is condensed and then it went to the further fractal distillations. The current source is here by given by the two electrodes, the Siemens deposition reactors where the purified silicon is condensed, the purified silicon will be condensed here. This is the electronic grade silicon, same purity level as silicon wafers, but these are polycrystalline adapted from the synthesis and purification of the bulk semiconductor from the book Baron and Smith. Now, Siemens process has some disadvantage. One big disadvantage is that it requires a lot of energy and actually this is the main reason why the single crystal silicon solar cell is so costly and the yield is also low like 37 percent. So, in industry people like the yield should be very high and the cost of production should be low. The high cost of this stays, but the advantage is that we can reach a purity of 99.9999, even you can add 2 more 9 for an industry grade silicon at this much purity percentage. So, there are some disadvantage and some advantage related to the Siemens method. 
but the Siemens method produce a polycrystalline silicon. We need to get a single crystal silicon starting from a polycrystal silicon. How we can get that? There are two different methods for that for getting the crystal pooling or ingots pooling for the nanocrystalline silicon which is circular in shape. There are two methods that one is called Swarovski technique and another is called the float zone technique. We will learn about these techniques today. In Swarovski technique, this is the dominant technique for manufacturing single crystal. It is especially suited for the large wafers that are currently used in IC fabrication. And in float zone technique, this is used for the small size wafers. The float zone technique is used for producing specifically wafers that have low oxygen impurity concentrations. Now, in, in Swarovski technique, a symmetric of the growth process is shown in the next figure. Here, there are different components are there. One component is furnace, then there are crystal pooling mechanism, there are ambient control atmosphere and there are control system. The starting method from the CZ process is electronic grade silicon. So, this silicon are electronic grade silicon, but they are polycrystalline which is melted in the furnace. To minimize contamination, the crucible is made of silicon dioxide or SINX. So, so that the silicon here is kept in an environment of silicon only. The furnace is heated above 1500 degree Celsius since silicon melting point is 1412 degree Celsius. So, silicon melting point is 1412 degree Celsius Celsius. So, if you have to melt silicon then we need to heat it beyond this temperature and in CZ method the polycrystalline silicon is heated at 1500 degree Celsius. A small seed crystal with the desired orientation of the final wafer is dipped in the molten silicon and slowly withdrawn by the crystal pooling mechanisms. So, to grow the single crystal we need to have a seed. So, first a small seed of the fine wafer is dipped inside the molten silicon and slowly withdrawn by the crystal pooling methods. So, the, the liquid silicon will grow on this seed and will get a single crystal silicon. Here you can see in this flask we have the molten silicon and then the grown the seed crystal is showing here. So, the seed crystal is first dipped into the molten crystal and then the on the top of the seed crystal the silicon single crystal will start growing and eventually it will grow to a large single crystal. And this is the crucible and this is the RF heating coil. This is a schematic of the CZ growth technique the polycrystalline silicon is melted and a single crystal seed is then used to nucleate a single crystal ingot. The single crystal controls the orientation of the, the growth of this crystal. So, as it happens in a normal crystal growth we need to have a seed and then the seed helps for the nucleation and then we need to have a growth process. Now, depending upon the rate of the nucleation and the growth we can get the grain size of the single crystal. So, the method is very simple here we have a molten silicon which the molten silicon we got it by heating the silicon at high temperature. Then to get a single crystal we dip we dip a mold or a, a seed of the single crystal inside this molten silicon and the silicon started growing on that and depending upon the heat and temperature and the growth kinetics we get the larger or smaller side of single crystal silicon and this process is the Swarovski's method. In a Swarovski's technique or CZ technique the seed crystal is also rotated while it being pulled. So, when it is being pulled it is also rotated why rotation to get a uniform distribution to ensure uniformity across the surface. The furnace is rotated in the direction opposite to the crystal puller. So, if the crystal puller is rotated in the right hand side the furnace is rotated on the left hand side. The molten silicon sticks to the seed crystal and starts to solidify with the same orientation as the seed crystal is withdrawn. Thus, a single crystal ingot is obtained. To create doped crystal the dopant material is added to the silicon melt so that it can be incorporated in the growing crystal. Semiconductor gets polycrystalline silicon to single crystal silicon wafers is showing at here. You see that ACG polycrystalline silicon is first melted in a crucible with trace level of one of the dopants required to the complication of the device is added. So, first we take the molten silicon what is the ACG level silicon and then depending upon what kind of impurity we need to add for our final application we can add an aluminum based impurity or a boron based impurity and finally, we get a doped silicon which is showing here on the right hand side. For solar cell boron a p type dopant is normally used using a seed crystal and with very close control temperature. It is possible to pull out a p type doped seed crystal 
from this melt. So, what happens like you know, so let us say this is a seed crystal and this is my silicon chunks or molten silicons. So, the molten silicons is first dipped inside this and it is take out and you get a silicon ingot like this. A large cylindrical single crystal of silicon of diameter of excess 12.5 centimeter and 1 to 2 millimeter in length are routinely grown in this matter. You see the ingot like you know this is the this is the crystal and this is the seed and this is the molten silicon and the ingot is large as 1 to 2 meter in length and the diameter is 12.5 centimeter. So, this is the shape of a ingot, but this is a very large ingot to make it useful we need to cut it we need to cut it by a diamond size and make it a piece of the silicon wafer from it. How can we do that? Then the large single crystal is sliced up into wafers which are as thin as possible. Silicon solar cells need only 300 micrometer thickness to absorb most of the appropriate wavelength in the sunlight. So, if the, if the thickness is 300 micron, so we need to cut the wafer in that dimension. And here we are showing that starting from the silicon this ingot we cut it in a single piece to get this kind of silicon wafers. So, slicing of thin wafers from a cylindrical ingot the techniques used for the slicing process are described in the reference also and usually we use the diamond cutter to cut it and during the cutting process also we waste some of the silicon. And finally, this is kept in a box which has been separated one of the wafer from the other. The present wafering technology is difficult to cut wafers from the large crystal to wafers thinner than 300 microns and still retain reasonable yields. So, so far nowadays we can easily cut until 300 micrometers, but going beyond that is always difficult. But 300 micrometer is good for us because that is good enough to absorb the sunlight for a silicon solar cell. More than half the silicon is wasted as curves or cutting loss in this process. So, that means if the most of the silicon got wasted during the cutting process, so the yield is low. So, that is why even starting from a single crystal to get a silicon wafer the yield is very low. So, now we have single crystal wafers in our hand the next job is to make a silicon solar cell. After etching the silicon wafers and cleaning them additional impurities are introduced inside the cell in a controlled manner at a high temperature diffusion process. So, we take this silicon wafer in some kind of cylindrical or uh, rectangular chamber like this and it is made at a very high temperature and whatever the impurity we have to put like you know we diffuse that impurity inside this and to make it either a p doped or an n doped semiconductor. To make solar cell n type impurities must be introduced to give a p n junction. We have already a p doped semiconductor, but to make a p n junction solar cell we need an n type impurity on top of the p type semiconductor. So, phosphorus is an n type impurity which is generally used to make n doping. So, phosphorus is usually used to make the p type semiconductor and n doped semiconductor so that we get a n p semiconductor. How can we do that? A carrier gas is bubbled through the phosphorus oxychloride POCl3 mixed with a small amount of oxygen and passed down to a heated furnace tube in which the wafers are stacked. This grows an oxide layer on the surface of the wafers containing phosphorus at the temperature involved 800 to 1000 degree Celsius. The phosphorus diffuse from the oxide into the silicon. So, first if we take this chamber we have this silicon wafer and then we are putting a carrier gas. The carrier gas contains phosphorus oxychloride. Here the phosphorus is mixed with a small amount of oxygen. What will happen? They will make a layer of the oxide on top of this silicon wafer. And finally, at high temperature from 800 to 1000 degree Celsius, this phosphorus will slowly diffuse in the bottom of this oxide layer and it will dope the silicon. After about 20 minutes, the phosphorus impurities override the boron impurity in the region near the surface of the wafer to give a thin heavily doped n type region. We have learned before that for a p n junction silicon solar cell n type is very very thin and heavily doped. So, that the depletion region extend inside the p regions. Now, the phosphorus diffusion process is showing here you can see that silicon wafers which are stacked here and this is the cylindrical tube. Now, the carrier gas comes from here. So, the liquid POCl3 that mixed in the carrier gas and comes through here. So, the oxygen and nitrogen is also parts a very slow very small amount of oxygen and nitrogen gas. Now, once it goes through this chamber. So, there makes a very thin layer of the oxide which contains the phosphorus. Now, when we heat this chamber then what will happen the phosphorus will slowly diffuse inside and override the boron impurity to make a highly doped and narrow NP junction. 
So, on the top of the p type silicon we get a n type doping or we get a n p junction. So, here in the first figure we are showing the distribution of the phosphorus impurities immediately after the diffusion process and after etching of the back side of the wafer. So, when the diffusion is completed at high temperature phosphorus sits on all the sides, but we need the nitrogen we need the end doping only on the top we do not need at the back. So, we need to etch this side and we need to also etch this side. So, when we etch the bottom side and the two sides we get the n type doping on the top. So, we have n type doping on the top and p type doping at the bottom we get the p n junction. The standard technology to metal contact are then attached to both the n type and p type region. So, now to complete a solar cell what we need we need a sandwich type of structure we need to have two electrodes one is cathode another is anode. So, here we have a silicon solar cell which is like a p type and then there is an n type semiconductor, but to make the contact I have to put some metal electrode. So, that the electric circuit get completed to the metal is deposited in a very high vacuum. The standard technology to metal contact are then attached to both the n type and the p type region. The metal to be deposited is heated in a vacuum to high enough temperature to cause it to melt and vaporize. It will then condense on the cooler parts of the vacuum system and then directly go and deposit on this wafer. So, the back contact is normally deposited over the entire back surface while the top contact is required in the form of the grid. Usually we use a shadow mask or metal shadow mask to make this grid the metal can be deposited over the entire front surface of the cell and subsequently etched away from unwanted region using a photographic technique called as photolithography. So, here we are showing this like <coughs> this is a metal mask and we have this molten metal which is kept in a crucible. So, when we heat at high temperature what will happen? Let us say it is an aluminum metal it will start vaporizing and the vapors the, the atoms of the metals they will go and start depositing on this thing depending upon the openings which is described by the mask. And we have a silicon wafer which is the back placed in the intimate contact with the mask. Now, wherever there is an opening according to the structure of the mask the metal will be go and deposited there. Now, we can selectively etch or we can selectively wash out that part of the metal which we need or which we do not need to make a very good contact. So, this figure is an essential feature of a vacuum vaporations of metallic layer as well as the use of a metallic mask to define the top metal grid pattern. We use the same technique for organic solar cell or even perovskite solar cells for metal depositions. The contact made up of three separate layers. The layer of titanium is used as the bottom layer, layer of silver is the top and the sandwich layer is palladium. So, there are three layers we make as a contact layer. After deposition the contact are sintered at 500 to 600 degree centigrade to give good adherence and low contact resistance. Finally, a thin anti reflection coating is deposited on the top of the cell by the same vacuum depopulation method. So, we have a back contact, then we have a p substrate, then we have a n diffuse substrate and then we have this we have this metal grid and then top of that we have a anti reflection coating and we have a contact bar. So, these are the grids and these are the contacts bar. So, one contact we take from here one contact we can take from here and we have a pn junction diode which is sandwiched between these two contact and just to reduce the light loss we have put it this kind of grid kind of structures and we also put it an anti reflection coating. To minimize the reflection from the flat surface of the silicon solar cell we usually texture the surface. So, that to minimize the flat surface sol silicon cell wafers these are textured. This means creating a rough surface so that the incident light will have a larger probability of being absorbed into the solar cell. So, if we make a surface very patterned or very textured, so the probability of absorption of the sunlight is much higher. This is performed by etching in a weak alkaline solution such as hydrofluoric acid. If we etch the silicon wafer on the top and if we look it under the ACM microscope it looks like that. So, you can see that this kind of the structure which is like periodic in nature is get by the wet etching process and this helps for the light to get more and more trapped and enter inside the silicon solar cell. The yield is about 90 percent from starting wafers to complete terrestrial cells can be obtained. This make the process very labor intensive. The vacuum evaporation equipment is expensive compared to the throughput, the material expensive such as silver. So, the material which is used in this case the, the contact that is silver and that is expensive and same time this process is very very labor intensive and energy extensive. So, that is why the cost of production becomes very high. 
Now we have a solar cell in our hand. So what you have to make? We have to make a solar module. After in interconnecting between cells, the solar cell needs to be encapsulated by the gas, either by mechanical for mechanical protection, for electrical isolation, chemical protection, and mechanical rigidity to support the petal cells and their flexible interconnection. So keep in mind that whenever we make a solar cell, we need to encapsulate the solar cell, and we encapsulate it by a special kind of glass. What is the objective behind encapsulation? First is mechanical protection so that the solar cells is protected from some kind of fracture or some kind of breaking. Second is electrical isolation. Let us say your solar cell is in the presence of some electrical device so that it does not get any kind of electrical inductions. Third is chemical protections by some mistake if somebody peels some kind of chemicals on that so our solar cells will be protected. Fourth is mechanical rigidity to support the petal cells and the flexible interconnections. So, so, these are the need why we need to encapsulate the solar cell. Now, next thing is that we will connect many solar cell to make module and connect more than two modules to make pan panels and to connect many panels to make a array. So, starting from solar cell, if we connect them, we will get them module. If we connect the two or more module, we will get panel. If we connect two or more panel, we get array. So, the array, the solar array which we usually see that actually consists of solar panel which is consist of solar module and this module is made of millions of solar cells, small cells which are in interconnected in series or in parallels. Here a single solar cell is showing here, when you connected all this silicon solar cells, you get this module. Then when you connect this so many modules together, you get this kind of panel where 1, 2, 3 modules are here. Now, if we have so many panels connected with each other, then we get a solar array which is useful for driving any load or giving the electricity in our room. So, today we have learned that starting from the metallurgical grade silicon, how we can get a semiconductor grade silicon and the process is called the Siemens method. But in Siemens method, we get a polycrystalline silicon. To make a solar cell, we need a single crystal silicon. Now, how can we make a single crystal silicon from a polycrystalline silicon? By Swarovski method. This method involves high temperature and we get a really pure silicon. Now, this silicon we can make by P doping, but for making it useful for a solar cell application, we have to put a layer of N doping on top of the P doped semiconductor. How can we make it N doped? So, usually we use a carrier gas which contains the phosphorus as an impurity and a very small amount of oxygen and at high temperature an oxide layer is formed on top of this P doped silicon. Then at very high temperature the phosphorus goes diffuse inside it and make a layer of the P doping all the way surrounding this silicon wafer. But what will happen like we have to selectively etch the n type doping from the back end and from the side end so that we get n type doping on the top only. So, and in this process we get a PN junction silicon solar. Now the rest of the job is to put the metal electrode and put some contact. This metal electrode is put at high vacuum and at very high temperature. This process is very very cumbersome process and usually we use some kind of metal mask to get a desired kind of geometry. Finally, we put some contact and anti reflection coating. The job of the anti reflection coating is to minimize the reflection loss as much as possible and our solar cell is completed by putting the, the PN junction silicon between the two electrodes. So, it is like a sandwich kind of devices. So, once we have a silicon solar cell in hand, then we can connect two or three silicon solar cell to make a module. Then two or three module come together to make a solar panel and then further two or three solar panel come together to make a solar array. So, the required voltage or the required current what we get from the solar array becomes much higher than a single solar cell which satisfies our daily activities. So, today we learnt about starting from the metallurgical grade silicon how we can make a silicon solar cell and make a silicon solar array. For more details you can look for the microchip fabrication a very nice book by Peter Van Jant and also the synthesis and purification of bulk semiconductor Baron and Smith. And obviously, our standard textbook solar photovoltaics fundamental technology and application by Jetan Singh Solanki. Thank you very much.